Back in 1928, on a cold December opening day, nearly 4,000 theater goers lined Highland and Warren Avenues in Downers Grove, Illinois, for a chance to see a film premiere in a marvelously appointed 1,400-seat sound-enabled theater. But this remarkable turnout wasn't just for any theater. This was the heralded Wonder Theater of the Western Suburbs that so many had read about, gossiped about, and witnessed the multi-year construction of. The movie that opening day was Facile. And this wonder theater was the Tivoli Theater in Downers Grove, Illinois. Designed and built to rival any picture palace being built to date. Designed to impress with its glamorous and exotic blend of Art Deco, Middle Eastern, and Asian influences of architecture. While American filmmaking was still in its infancy, it was doing what live theater couldn't, promising theater goers a more frequent, dependable show schedule at a ticket price that everyone could afford. This business model attracted increased investment from the burgeoning film studios in Hollywood and many savvy theater investors across the country. It also caught the eye of a local Downers Grove entrepreneur and father and son team of lawyers, Gustav and George Bungie. The Bungies had a vision for something beyond just a neighborhood picture house. This plan was for something more beautiful and lavish than anything anyone had seen in the area. A theater that could hold not only live performances, traveling musicians, and vaudeville acts, but it could also be leveraged in the up till now non-profitable dark hours of a live theater to project talking picture shows multiple times per day and on unbooked nights for the theater. In a theater so majestic that it would pull crowds in by the train car full from the downtown areas of Chicago, this special theater building could offer hotel rooms, restaurants, beauty parlors, and bowling alleys for the wealthy socialites from Chicago to turn their movie experience into a weekend respite in the tranquil southwest suburbs of Downers Grove. Downers Grove was not a town bereft of movie houses. In fact, they already had two. The Dickey Theater, a smaller theater, which opened around 1906, showed two and three real films using a hand-cranked projector and a piano accompanist. The theater was located on the second floor of the Dickey Building at Forrest and Warren and housed as many as 200 wooden chairs for spectators to watch the films. These chairs would be lifted by rope into the attic when movies weren't being shown to allow for dances and benefits to be held there. There were two shows per week and an occasional matinee. In the film reels, on loan from different Chicago theaters, had to be immediately driven back by motorcycle into the city by Dickey's son, Grant, who would return to Downers Grove often past midnight, still on motorcycle. In 1915, a new theater, operating under the name the Don Theater, had an increased seating capacity of about 400. Around this time, the Paragon Theater opened at 1007 Curtis, eventually renamed the Curtis Theater. There were even plans in the mid-1920s for two separate 1,200-seat Spanish-inspired theaters, one on the east side of Main Street, facing Grove, called the Alamo, and another similarly designed theater planned and started, but mysteriously abandoned, at 935 Curtis. 
By the 1920s, these more modern village theater offerings closed the Dickey. But the dreams of something bigger might have belonged to a gifted, teenaged piano player at the Dickey, who accompanied so many of those silent films. His name was George Bungie. George's father, Gustav Bungie, was an immigrant from Germany who'd worked his early years as a station agent for the Burlington. While putting himself through law school, he was elected a Downers Grove trustee in 1895 and later opened a law firm, becoming the village lawyer for Downers Grove and for several other adjacent communities. In 1925, Bungie drafted the Downers Grove General Ordinances, which among many other things also regulated movie theaters. Bungie's son George was a prodigy, a gifted musician. He was also Downers Grove High School's first yearbook editor. He completed high school in just three years and went straight into Northwestern's prestigious law school, earning his degree in 1925. Shortly after his graduation, Gustav and George employed the architect team of Van Gunten and Van Gunten, two Ohio-born brothers, Orlando and Tillman, who'd opened a firm on Huron Street in Chicago. They specialized in designing schools, hospitals, and clinics, retail and commercial properties, but only one movie palace, the Tivoli Theater in Downers Grove. For construction of such a magnificent property, the Bungies chose leading Downers Grove builder, J.T. Schles, who is responsible for this masterpiece and for many other buildings in Downers Grove, which still stand today. Construction on the Tivoli building broke ground in the mid-1920s, but not until after removing the Bungie's primary residence to make way for the building. The house was relocated, intact, to the location it currently resides, 4943 Highland Avenue. The front door of the home would have sat directly where the entrance to the theater is today. From the opening matinee, the theater was a success nearly the first in the country to be purpose-built for the Vitaphone and Movie Tone sound support, bringing synchronized sound and picture together to marvel moviegoers with truly immersive talking pictures. The Tivoli's popularity grew to such extremes that local church leaders even petitioned the village to close the theater on Sundays to address the dwindling congregation populations in their churches. After the Bungie's Tivoli tenure, this remarkable theater had several generations of owners and managers over the next 50 years, and eventually fell into disrepair during the 1970s, and later even closed for a short period of time. But this is where another visionary family stepped in, a family from Downers Grove who would invest decades of passion, interest, time and money, and blood, sweat, and tears to resurrect not only this ailing movie palace, but go on and reinvigorate 16 more Main Street theaters in and around the area to their former glory throughout the 1980s. Enter Willis Johnson, born in Berwyn in 1937. Um. Born January 11th, 1937, in uh, Berwyn. Uh, that, that, that's just the... the uh, Closest hospital? Hospital that my parents chose. All, always lived at 4812 Bryan Place in Downers Grove. Was it Sears home? Um, it's gone. They tore it down to build one of the monsters that Downers is building now. Uh, it was the... Uh, there were three sledding hills in in Downers Grove, uh, Bryan Place, um, Lincoln, and Lee. And we lived in Bryan at the top of the hill. I, I have a, a sister, Sarah, who was born in 1944. She has passed away. A brother, Ross, uh, who still lives in Downers Grove over on Gilbert. Uh, and was born in 1939, September of 39. There, uh, of course, at that time, 
there was a, where Washington Park is today, it was Washington School, which came from the 1800s. Uh, or, or a good part of it came from 1800. And I was reminiscing the other day, it, I used to, uh, I would come home for lunch. Washington School is half a block away. So I used to come home for lunch. There were four schools, as I remember, right in Downers at that time. Longfellow, Whittier, Washington, Lincoln, and the high school. And so uh, I went to all the first seven grades at Washington. Then everybody else, when you, when you got to the eighth grade, you, you went to Lincoln. And everybody went through Lincoln. And, and then you went to uh, Donners Grove High School. The superintendent of, a, uh, of Lincoln was a, a lady named Zella Morehouse. Uh, I have no idea why I remember that, but <laughs> I do. First job, I did, my first job was uh, cutting grass when I was 12 years old. And I cut, uh, they, didn't, they did not have rotary lawnmowers. I bought a Craftsman real type lawnmower uh, and just cut a lot of houses. I used to, and now I'm trying to think, to remember Friedenhagen, Mr. Friedenhagen, who was one half of the Prince Castle uh, factory. He was an interesting person. He owned the corner of Second and Fairview, the North, East corner was a biggest, uh, I guess you, to some degree you'd call it today, you'd call it an estate. Uh, that of course is where Pepperidge Farm is. I went to work for a Triangle Service, the gas station, a Phillips 66 station at the Northwest corner. Washington and Warren, owned by a guy named Tommy Willard, who lived behind us. At, he lived on Highland, and uh, I worked there off and on. I was still working there when I was in college. Um, my father and my uncle uh, worked for International Harvester Company. My father at a factory called Tractor Works, 31st and Western. Uh, they both had management jobs. My father, who was always working, always doing something, his, his, uh, his doctor, I guess today you might call him a cardiologist, told him that he needed to do something other than International Harvester Company, that uh, he, needed it. he needed something else in life. My father was always, was always involved in, in something. Anyway, there was a, a printing company named uh, Walter J. Thompson Printing Company, which was at 63rd and Grand, who had the, who had a little printing building in the back of his, of his property and, uh, and had been a printer. And so uh, in the meantime, my brother, Ross had gotten interested in printing, and uh, thing. But they, anyway, they ended up buying the printing company, and they operated it at Mr. Thompson's house. And uh, in the meantime, my uncle uh, Martin Johnson, who lived in unincorporated uh, Downers at Belmont, built a new house, and he built it in such a way that he could they could move the printing equipment into the basement where it became Johnson Printers. And then you moved from there back over on uh, Washington, right? Right. We built that building in 1963. In the meantime, and I don't remember why this occurred, but it did, 
my mother bought the house that still sits at 5006 Washington. And uh, then uh, I married uh, Arlene Lieb, who lived at 4930 Lee. I went to Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo. We, uh, we bought her brother's house trailer, which was in Ohio, and, and, uh, and moved it back to Kalamazoo and lived in Frost Trailer Park until 1959, when uh, I had finished college and moved back here. I moved back. Arlene did not because she, we needed to sell the house trailer. So she had to stay in Kalamazoo till she could get the house trailer sold. And in the meantime, I bought 1311 Gilbert, which was, we were always told, a Dickey house. Uh, the Dickies that had a frozen food locker plant on Fairview. In its first iteration, it looked like a log cabin. That's, that was the way the, the, uh, the lumber was, was cut. So uh, then I went into service. Yes, I was in the Army Reserves. I knew that if I didn't join the Army, I would get drafted. So I went to Fort Leonard Wood for basic training stationed at uh, Port Jackson, South Carolina, where I taught in wheeled vehicle mechanic school. Mechanics and cars and vehicles always interested me. Then uh, came home. I went to work for International Harvester Company as a time study engineer. International Harvester Company was going through some really tough times as most manufacturing companies were at that point, which was in the, uh, uh, if I recall right, it was in the mid 60s. I got laid off. Harvester had 26 time study engineers, as I recall at that time, and they did not need 26 time study engineers. So I came back and uh, to, to family and I said, you know, I don't really know anything about printing, but uh, I can sell. And so, you know, you run the printing and I'll sell printing. And so that then we built that building on, on 5006 Washington and uh, things grew from there. But there was a company across the, the railroad tracks called Deluxe Poster Company, by, owned by two, the two Eichelman brothers. They wanted to get out of the business. And so we ended up buying Deluxe Poster, and we moved the printing operation from 5006 Washington to on uh, Burlington. The building right, right across from the train station where Egg Harbor and the apartments are, that's where, that's where the building was. That was the building. Several that, buildings. The building that was Deluxe at that point had been uh, due slaughter Dodge and De I think it was Dodge and DeSoto. And Car then, dealership. And I, as far as I know, the Eichelmans bought it, that part of it. And, uh, and then we bought the Lux poster. Johnson Printers was just a, a uh, was just a commercial printer. You know, want business cards, want a letterhead, want tickets, whatever we would print it. Deluxe Poster printed, primarily printed posters for the uh, food industry. We would print the, the uh, big signs that you'd put in a window that said, you know, flour to $29.95 or whatever it is. We ran two shifts. 
had about 130 employees, as I recall. We started a family. I don't remember. Do you remember what year Chris was born? I mean, not Chris. Uh, Steve, Steve was born in September of 1961. That was number one, and I think that was the that was the end of the family on Gilbert. And then we bought a house at 4929 Montgomery. We didn't break the cycle of having kids, though. <laughs> uh, then we had, uh, I think I was in vitro on Gilbert and then we moved over, uh, to Montgomery yeah. and, uh, yes. And then we had, uh, we had Amy, Wendy, Wendy. <laughs> Correct. And, uh, yes, in 1969, April of. And we. <laughs> Kind of joked about it because, well, we had uh, the boys and the one girl. Uh, my wife at the time said, "Well, we can't just have one girl," so we had, an, <laughs> so we had uh, Amy. They all live in this area, but in uh, in 1973, my first wife and I separated and I needed a place to live. And at that time, in, in looking at the different opportunities, the Tivoli Hotel was there, and it was $31 a week, and you got a, a room, and, uh, and I needed a place to live, and, uh, and moved into the Tivoli Hotel. And, and, and in moving in, got to know Daniel Montesano, who was a nice Italian gentleman from Chicago, who owned the Tivoli building and lived in the building and ran the hotel. And uh, he and I got to be friends. And uh, ultimately, he, he decided he wanted to sell the hotel. I was, I was very interested in real estate, but he got made it possible for myself uh, and my brother Ross uh, to uh, buy the building. Then uh, we were we had uh, divergent opinions on running a printing business. I made a choice. You know, either you can have the real estate and I'll take the printing business, or you can have the printing business and I'll take the real estate. Uh, so the, and in the end, I took the hotel. This deal included privilege for Montesanto to stay living and run the hotel, while the theater would be run by theater tenant Oscar Brotman. Brotman was a Chicago attorney who ran several theaters in the Chicagoland area. Brotman's vision for the aging theater was something far less than its sparkling pedigree. In fact, the theater, at one time under Brotman's control, even resorted to showing X-rated films in 3D. One morning in 1978, a year after taking ownership of the building, Willis Johnson awoke to a surprise. We had, uh, Shirley and I had, had subsequently gotten married and uh, we, we woke up one morning and on the marquee it said close for remodeling. And we knew, we, we had learned enough about the, the theater business to know that he was gone. And, and in the theater business, everybody uh, bought, had individual leases for, for, for theaters. They didn't do anything as a, quote, a company and uh, so we knew that uh, there was no way he could he could bankrupt the, the Tivoli Theater and walk away, which he did. So they left in the middle of the night 
and put a close for a remodeling sign on the theater shortly after their purchase of the building. And he had to decide what to do. And, and I think he interviewed quite a few theater operators and decided that, wow, this is not, uh, these are not people that I want to sign a lease with. And the general, well, the manager at the time, Ed Doherty, proposed, hey, I know how to do the day-to-day, -day, and if you do the business end of it, we can operate this theater. And I think that was the that was the birth of classic cinemas and the whole the whole theater empire. And you were in your 40s at the time, and uh, started the downtown theater purchases. The uh, the other thing too is when these prospective buyers were coming in, they were that was at the time when uh, theaters were being multiplexed, being twinned, and. Willis loved the Tivoli Theater. It was his hometown theater. And he couldn't stand the thought of somebody coming in and tearing it apart. So when Ed proposed running the uh, operation, Willis was all for it. Yeah, so that was, that was the beginning of the, the sort of Tivoli Theater uh, actual from an operation standpoint. And and the beginning of the redoing of the theater. Yep, um, sure was. You have a better memory than I do. Well, by <laughs> far. When we took over the theater, the village, uh, I guess probably it was the building department, but anyway, you made said, well, there's some things that you need to do. And I said, but, but why? You know, the theater just is the way it's been. Well, yes, but there's some, there's some things that, that we let go because you had, it, the theater's been operating. It, it never closed at that point, as far as we knew. And uh, so we, we were closed from, from the end of June until the first part of August. 1978. At some point in time, before we were ever involved, the inside of the, of the building, of the, the auditorium, was blue green, sea green, everything. No, 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 no. Yeah, the entire building was one color and the screen covered the entire proscenium arch. So there was no decorative, um, you could not really, it was just a, it was a dark room with a lot of uh, thick uh, curtain, sound curtain, and this giant screen in front of the proscenium arch. And one of the first things coming in was bringing the screen back to the, to the original proscenium arch and having the plaster restored. And it was, it was a big project. That took a little while. We definitely opened prior to that happening. So it, it was an evolution. I know that I started as an usher in 1980, and at that point, it was still uh, that solid color, solid uh, lobby, uh, you know, and uh, very, it was not restored. Actually, our, our first grand opening was, we tied in with the Easter seals and everything, which was grand opening was in 1986, which, wow, that took a long time. But, uh, but there was a lot of exposing plaster and painting and stuff along the way. And we had to find people to do some of the, some of what we could do and so we had to find people to do it in 1978 the, the probably the, the, there were a number of things that we needed to, to needed to take care of more uh, code issues more electrical than anything else uh, to, to bring the building up, up to code some of the things that were very obvious, the chandeliers. They said, well, we hope you'll fix the chandeliers. 
so that they so that they will work, uh, which uh, which we did. That was a very uh, difficult job because what they had done is is operated the chandeliers until all the bulbs burned out, and then they just never they never turned them on or, or bothered with it. The chandeliers are suspended on chain uh, in the ceiling. Shirley and I decided that we would uh, we could fix the chandeliers, or we can at least look at them. And uh, so we did. I devised a way to lower the chandeliers to ultimately put the bulbs in. And uh, uh, the story that that I guess this is one of our favorites. <laughs> um, we uh, I, I got a a, a door just a, a slab door, and uh, I would lay it on top of the seats under the A chandelier, and then I would lower the the, the, uh, the chandeliers down and rest them on the uh, on the door, and then we would would not only put the bulbs in, but we would wash the, the glass pieces. We got to the fifth chandelier. I screwed up and and pulled out a uh, pipe. The way the chandeliers were suspended, it fell off the hook on the chain that suspended the uh, the chandeliers, and uh, went and went crashing down 25 feet and uh, hit the uh, hit the door. The door exploded literally. Uh, fortunately, Shirley was standing a few feet away. Uh, so you were, when that chandelier started to fall. I was upstairs and I said, oh my God, because he let loose too soon. Oh, I thought you were down here. No, I was upstairs. I ran, Okay. I ran all the way down and I got down and said, oh my gosh, it's not broken. Because I thought I would see glass all over the seats. It, it, it did not damage the chandelier at all. That was it. Amazing, especially since there's glass panels in them. But anyway, I, that, that's getting really carried away to some degree. So one time we had a, a, a major wind event and rain event and, and it came through town and it ripped the roof off of the building. And the sad part is we had peeled it back. Peeled it back. We had just finished all of this ornate painting and 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 uh and then it was raining full on in here we were in the basement there all the tenants came downstairs and we came up and and went on the roof and it was just it was open and raining and so then we had to do it all again so that was uh that was definitely a heartbreaking point in in sort of the keeping the tivoli alive i remember it being on the roof and the part that i remember is the roofer his name was tom tidwell was was walking on a probably a foot wide brick and it's you know it's four stories or whatever it is and he's just walking you know like a tightrope and I couldn't look because I'm like he's oh. gonna fall to his death but he you know that's what roofers do and and ultimately we got it fixed so when we took over the theater there was a concession counter that was we didn't know anything about running concessions. And actually, concessions didn't come into old theaters until really the 50s to kind of supplement the income for the theater. It was, it was, uh, uh, it was a way of making additional money. And so when we took over, there was, a, there was a vending machine that you could get that would drop a little cup and a little bit of shaved ice uh, and, uh, and, and probably about 10 or 12 ounces of, of soft drink. It was teeny. And that was eight, eight, ounce. eight ounces. Can you imagine an eight ounce no. drink? And, and, and when the cup dropped, sometimes it would get out of position. Yeah. And, and, and the soda would just go in, in, in down the drain. The drain. <laughs> and, we, and there was a rule that you, did, you never gave refunds. So. <laughs> Here, for for the for a, a missed soft drink. Definitely, customer service or guest service has changed over the years. And then the concession counter 
you know, originally, then we 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 did get uh, soft drink machines, and we just had we just had cups with no ice and no lids, and I don't even think yeah, they had straws yeah. to begin with, and there was no cup holders. Can you imagine a, a theater without lids, straws, ice, or cup holders? But that's how it started, and the uh, the the popcorn machine behind there, you don't get burned all the time. It, it was. Uh, it was definitely uh, an interesting operation, but you know, as things progressed, then we learned, hey, people do like, you know, like a, a ice cold drink, and we really tried to make uh, improvements, you know, in our in our concessions, and ultimately, we expanded the concession counter and made and redid it, you know, had a, a better offering. The other thing, going back to the theater, the original seats were taken out in the 50s again. I think in the 50s there was a big renovation because they they put a new marquee on, they put new seats in, and then it was, I think it was like 2000, we actually reseated it again and we put new seats in. So these were, the seats that are currently here have been there since the, the very early 2000s. but. The idea is that we were trying to compete with the mall theaters. And, and just as a general sort of statement, you know, when we got into this business, malls were where it was at. Downtowns were not, you know, in, in, the, in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, malls were this new, this newfound excitement. And so downtowns were on the dump. So we, we got into it and tried to make this attractive. And, and so whether it be, um, you know, sprucing up the theater or, or making the concessions better, we were always a bargain theater at the time because the film companies would only give the first run movies to the mall theaters and, and, and the other ones. We were just a small, a small uh, player in the, in the big scheme of things. So that's kind of the genesis of, of you know, where, where the theater, uh, began and why the uh, why the renovations occurred yeah we we had a lot of uh, interesting people who made the Tivoli hotel their home <laughs> it transitioned from being a a typical hotel to a residential hotel and now you know the average stay is four years and it's pretty much full all the time and I think our longest tenant is over 20 years now has lived in the hotel so it definitely you know is more of a home I don't know when that started uh, but but it definitely turned into a, kind of a long-term occupancy well and that's what it was when you know obviously when I moved, moved in okay so was there any other famous people or interesting people that lived at the hotel well, we had, a, I don't remember the man's name, but he rented a room, didn't he, Willis? And he he never really stayed in the hotel, but he rented it for, for years. Never met the man. Got a print check, like clockwork, and never met him. And how many years did he have that room? He he had there, he started there when, when Mr. Montesano still had the hotel. So it was before us. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of like a mailing address or, or something that... Uh, he was a farmer in central Illinois. Okay. Yeah, it was weird. Just, just... I guess the $31 a week was pretty attractive for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was very attractive. Yeah. Then we had Gus. Gus was a retired postman. postman? Yep. And he was he was a character. <laughs> he he liked to bend the elbow, so with downers being dry, he would get on the train and he'd go to Westmont and visit uh, the local <laughs> tavern there, and then he'd come back home to Tivoli Hotel. <laughs> You know, going back to your point, though, you know, when you talked about Gus and Downers Grove being dry, I don't remember Downers Grove being dry because Gus used to sit at the bar at the Tivoli Bowling Alley and drink. 
Well, this was in the earlier. Okay. At a point in time, the only place that in Downers that you could get a drink other than the bowling alley, which we still never figured out how the bowling alley got the license, but was was uh, the last word. That was the only liquor license in Downers Grove. Okay. All right. So, there was a, a teacher at North High oh. named Catherine Reuter. She and her mother had two rooms on the second floor, and she taught at the high school, and her mother lived with her. They had a bedroom, a bathroom, and then their living room. And, and uh, where did they eat? I, I don't know. Probably like Mr. Montesano at, uh, at uh, round the clock snack time. That's yeah. where you'd always find Mr. Montesano. He had breakfast, lunch, and supper. Oh my gosh. <laughs> she parked her car at Triangle Service, which was the, the place where I worked. She would call and say, I'm going to use the car today. And you'd get it out of the garage and, and she would come and get it. But uh, she and her mother lived together. Ultimately, her mother passed away. And in her 50s, she got married, left Downers Grove, moved to someplace down south. She passed on, and when she passed on, she gave the, the school system like $500,000. The building was originally built on the second floor of the hotel. There was a restaurant, and it went through several iterations. It was the uh, offices for district, for the Board of Education, which at that time was District 58 and 99. Uh, they were here for 18 years, and they that had moved out, and it, it, there had been a beauty school. There was Mr. Way's Karate School. I remember what, something occurred in the in the petroleum industry, and uh, he decided to go back to Texas because he could make more money as a geologist. So we had this, we had it sitting, uh, this space, uh, which was probably about 2,000 square feet, and uh, we decided to make it into an apartment for ourselves. where you work, you know, the, your, your whole life is focused on that, on that fact. And it, and it was, uh, we used to sit in the apartment and uh, watch television or whatever. You could smell the popcorn being popped and, and, uh, and Shirley said, you know, this is ridiculous. We, we need a point, an entry point. So uh, we literally cut a hole in the wall put a door in it so that uh, Mary Shirley could uh, walk down to the concession counter and get popcorn. I'm going to jump in and, and elaborate a little bit on that story. You know, I, I started as an usher in 1980. The funniest uh, moment regarding my dad in that was the one day a customer came up and said, hey, why is there a, a man in his pajamas in the lobby? Hmm. And he had come down to get some popcorn and he did this on habit. We're, we're open, we're watching movies and you know working and here he is coming down in his pajamas and getting um, popcorn. Not something you would normally see in a theater and I can understand why that guest said that, but um, yes, he just walked down and got his popcorn and went back up. But it was a very convenient, uh, uh, way to get down, and you never knew when he would pop in. The barbershop was where we had our second office. 
the first being upstairs. And then when we expanded, because <laughs> we needed to bring one more person in, another son, I think, then we moved down to the converted what had been the barber shop into our office. And we were there for several years. But also there, there was a funeral home too, which I, I don't know if we have pictures of, but there was a funeral home right where um, Rocky's, where a sheer encounter is. Right. And the uh, there were stairs from that down, down to the embalming area where our offices were. And actually at one point, my office was in the back uh, and I found that out and I, it was a little creepy, but you know, I got through it, but I don't know if we have any, I think we found like a calendar from some sort of- but Adams and Winterfield. Oh, it was Adams and Winterfield. Well, there we go, I Adams think. and Winterfield, okay. Isn't that right, Wills? Yes. Okay, I'm not I'm sure. Not, I'm not sure that it was It was both names, Oh. but it's where Adams and Winterfield started, started okay. out. Okay. Another interesting thing we had, uh, there was two storefronts that, or, or there was a storefront that became the women's bathroom in the Tivoli. And because the original theater, the bathroom was downstairs. So you'd have to step up and walk downstairs. And that was kind of a tripping hazard. It wasn't accessible. And so we took out a storefront and we completely re reconfigured it. There, in a lot of these old theaters, they absolutely under um, fixtured the bathrooms. I, now, probably part of that was in, the, in 1928, there was no concession, so no drinks, no nothing. And so you, you weren't drinking this, right. you know, this, this big drink. But anyways, we thought that was uh, something to do. And then Aurelio's came uh, years later when they knocked down um, they were across the street and it was where around the clock was and that, and they moved over and they wanted a place. So we brought them in uh, to our building. When travel agents used to be big, mm -hmm. that was our last tenant prior to creating the Willis Theater. So um, yeah, there's been, there's been definitely, uh, definitely a few tenants, uh, you know, that occupied the, the, the building. So I grew up um, on Montgomery and, you know, again, I went to school at Longfellow and Washington and Herrick and, and Downers Grove North. When I was young, I actually, uh, my parents were divorced and so money was kind of tight. So I had all these harebrained ideas and we had a little toy uh, company. We made wooden toys and we sold them out of the front of Johnson Printers. Uh, to make some money. And then one day I got a call from my brother and said, hey, what, why don't you, you know, be an usher down at the, uh, at the theater? And I'm like, oh, I don't know about that. You gotta wear, I, I was in seventh grade at the time and you gotta wear a tuxedo and, you know, and, and you're in seventh grade. And, but I did and I came down and, and you know, and then I, I was making 310 an hour. Uh, my, first, my first movie was Star Trek, the original. It came out in 79 and we played it in, I think, March of 1980. But became an usher, single screen theater, and uh, worked here for three years. It was kind of a funny story that my dad had a, a meeting with everybody. He says, okay, you know, there's no raises. And he doesn't really remember the story, but I remember it vividly. So I took him at his word that, we would never get a raise working here. So um, I did get one raise, minimum wage went from 310 to 335. And so I got that raise, but I spent all my time in Downers Grove. Um, I remember going to Prince Pond and uh, this is kind of a story I should be embarrassed about, but um, just a little bit before Prince Pond was fully renovated, I was a BMX racer, a bike racer we put up jump ramps and we would jump into Prince Pond on our bikes. And I was always the one who got caught in the water um, <laughs> when the police came. And I still think I am the one, the reason that they have no swimming signs on Prince Pond uh, there, because again, it was multiple times, but that's, that's either here or there. As far as going home for lunch, when I went to Pierce Downer, when you went uh, there was, you could go to Burger King for lunch if you got a note from your parents. And so that was like the ultimate. 
uh, you could go and and by yourself walk over to Pier walk over to Burger King. That was when Burger King and Shakey's Pizza were next to each other, and you would go over there and you would eat lunch and then come back to to school. This is in fourth and fifth grade, you know, and uh, I thought that was the coolest thing. You know, some of my other memories in downtown were uh, they had the Main Street Pharmacy. You'd go over there and you'd get a a uh, cherry phosphate, which was basically a cherry Coke, and they would mix it up for you. It was the coolest thing ever. Or Woolworths, you know, you'd go over there and buy a lot of stuff. Everybody had a house account too, like Mokul's Hardware, you know, there was a house account. You'd go, you put it on our tab, you know, and they would bring, and then at the end of the month, they would bill you for it, which, you know, is, is kind of a, an odd concept, but it, it, it's absolutely, you know, what used to happen. You know, we would go to Forest Finder Foods for grocery shopping. Sears was right downtown. And then Mom and Pa Candies, we loved that because it was penny candy and they would, you know, you'd have a dime and you could go and you could buy candy and it's, uh, you know, such a treat. One time, me and my neighbor were downtown and we actually had a person pull a knife on us. This is in the 70s and say, it was like a young kid and he's like, Get, give me all your money. And I'm like, what? And we ran into, at the time it was InterVarsity Press, which is then turned into Founders Hill and now is Emmett's. But we ran in there and just, and then finally this kid left because he realized he's in an office building. He's still chasing us with a knife, which I thought was uh, out of this wow. world. And, and, and I was just a kid. I, I can't remember, you know, it was a rough and tumble downtown <laughs> on a couple occasions, wow. but you would do everything downtown. Grove Premium was the other place. That's where we used to shop for models and trains and Borghese's shoe store. That's, you know, you loaded up the family and you, you got your shoes once a year. Um, you know, whether you, well, of course you needed them because your feet were growing like crazy, but you'd go to Gishi's shoes and, and, you know, get your shoes. And uh, there were, uh, and, and then even the clothing stores, it was, uh, uh, Herbert's, but then there was Lori's and, and I forget the other one, but there was Lloyd's. A, Lloyd, Lori's and Lloyd's and then Herbert's. So it was men's, or kids, women's and, and men's mm -hmm. and that you'd have to get your, your gym uniform and that kind of thing. And downtown was a full, full, you know, top to bottom, your, your, your medical, your clothing, your appliances, your food. I mean, it was everything. So it was a much different sort of utility, whereas now it's a lot of, you know, uh, eating and, and entertainment and fun. And back then it was, you know, it was before the shopping malls and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I remember we used to go to the Tivoli. We had no idea that it had anything to do with our family, seeing a double feature or whatever it might be. And I got involved, yeah, again, first behind the scenes, then as an usher, then as a manager then working in the uh, office. When I graduated high school, uh, at the time I had been running around to the various theaters and managing, and I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. A friend of mine was like, hey, how are you gonna pay for college? I'm like, I don't know, maybe I'll join the army. And so I signed up and was all ready to go. And then my dad calls me and says, he said, hey, uh, I understand you're joining the army. Are you doing that because you you want to join the army or you want to pay for college? And I'm like, well, no, I just want to pay for uh, college. You know, he's like, well, maybe I can help you out. So it was kind of an interesting thing. And then I, I really got involved in the business at that point. And then I went over to UIC and again, I commuted. I would, my day would start. It was interesting. I would get on the train, the seven o'clock train, go to school. The train would drop me off exactly in front of the, the, the Tivoli Boeing, walk down the stairs, that's where our offices were. I'd work, I'd work for a while. Then I would, at night, I would go manage theaters. I was running myself ragged, but I was working like crazy and uh, really loved it. Wrote every single paper there is to write on movie theaters and how to operate them for, for my college career. You know, also during that time, as far as Downers Grove goes, we, we did operate we got the Tivoli South, was the Palace Theater and over in the Meadowbrook Shopping Center. It actually opened on my birthday, uh, 1986, which that goes back a ways. And so I used to manage that as well. 
a lot of good a lot of good memories in town and and uh, certainly I I personally grew up on Montgomery and then when I was 24 I moved to Cornell and bought a house there and lived there for 19 years and then I moved back over to Sealy so that's kind of my little bit of 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 history and you know, another thing kind of going back on this stage, and this is a vaudeville stage, uh, which means it's a little bit shallow, but it has a fly tower. So the screen can fly up into the tower. If you look at the back of the building, it it goes up, you know, double the height of the screen. So you can bring up whether it's uh, scenery or or the screen so you can open it up for live acts. And, you know, we've had all sorts of different concerts and events and beauty pageants and all sorts of anything that you can imagine we've had here. I remember when uh, when I was young I, and before we owned it, I came to, what was it, BJ and Dirty Dragon? Or I, I can't believe that's the name, but that was, uh, that was the name. <laughs> and they had this, you know, they were on Channel 9 or Channel 32 and you'd watch them and they came here and I was like, wow. And... The other, probably the most famous one we had here going back was Sonny and Cher, right? What, what didn't? Oh, in the early days. Yeah. yeah. Sonny and Cher performed here, which I think is pretty wild that that uh, that they were here. But yeah, we've along the way, you know, this stage we had. Uh, but in in later years, we teamed up with Anderson's Bookstore, and they brought their authors here. The authors would be on stage and give a little talk about their book or their life or whatever, and then they sign their books in the lobby. And we've had Julie Andrews here three times. Three times. So that that's our big claim to fame for yeah, the family. And Dick Van Dyke was here. Yeah, Alan Alda. You know, Richard Dreyfus and even some more contemporary folks. And even Gene Simmons from Kiss, oh, yeah. which, you know, whatever, but it-, it That's it, another story. It, it definitely has been a great place that, you know, sort of went beyond the original intent of being a movie palace. And, and uh, you know, it's a venue where people get together and and just love to, to you know, connect with the whatever's happening on stage. Actually, the other one is that uh, WGN does this series where they have a president, whether it's Thomas Jefferson, I think now they're doing one with um, Roosevelt, but they fill up, they sell every single seat in this auditorium. They actually, they have one in October, sold out. This sells out like, it's like a rock concert for seniors. And it is crazy how we could have another thousand seats. They just go nuts for this. So, so I mean, whether it's that or we had um, Anthony Michael Hall from, uh, you know, 16 Candles and kind of some other stars talking about that or, or whatever it may be, but it is definitely, there is definitely electricity when you get a whole group of people together and uh, you know, check something out together. In the in the old days, mid nineteen hundreds or nineteen twenties, rather, all all theaters had either an organ or a piano because there was there was there was no, was no sound in the film. And Tivoli had an organ, a Wurlitzer. Um, we, we have, or, or one of our associates has, has found the original organ, which I think is in South Dakota. Uh, there was a story about it being repossessed during the Depression. Is that true? Yeah. Well, we don't know that, but that was the story. So yeah. the story is how it ends up in South Dakota. In 1931, was... well, and, and the reason it left was because the worlds are apparently financed organs ah and and uh, they repossessed it and it went to this uh, in south dakota the 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 organ sat for right down here were uh, right over here because this the the, the 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 stage ended right up right out here where, where, the, where the there was an orchestra pit here 
they call it. And then the 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 organ the, was in the pit. The organ was in the pit. And then when we came, so that organ that ended up in South Dakota was gone. And when Oscar Brotman ran the theater, they didn't have an organ either. And so then in the 80s, you got a hold of a Barton organ. Where'd you get that from? The Rialto Theater in Champaign. Okay. The Rialto Theater in Champaign. And and that was a one rank organ, so no. all... Two rank. Barton, but it all came out of the one side. Yes. We, yeah. all, all of the pipes were, all on, the one pipes side. were on one side. So it was a really awkward uh, setup, but the amount of effort and time it took to put that one organ in was quite extensive. Yep. And uh, I remember being a part of that, and that was with the Chicago area, uh, Theater Organ, Cato, which is still around, Chicago area theater organ enthusiast. <laughs> And it would come out of the one side, and then it, it, at a point, they found this, the, the organ that is here now, that was from Indiana. Okay, that's right. right. And this is a Wurlitzer, and this Wurlitzer, I, you know, it's amazing how these organs can go from place to place, because it took three years to install it, and at least, to install the organ that is here now. And they put in all the pipes and did all this, and, we had this lift, and, and, and it was incredible. And then going, um, kind of go forward many years, we had uh, we had a concert here, and it was Poi Dog Pondering. And they had, oh gosh, 20-something people on stage, and it was super cramped, because the stage that we're sitting on today, is it's 19 feet from the edge of the stage to the original stage. So this wasn't here. Well, anyways, the lead singer, um, all of a sudden he is walking on the edge of the orchestra pit. And this couldn't really hold much. And, uh, and, and Frank is his name. And so Frank is doing this and I'm in the audience and I am just like nervous as all get out. Cause I'm like, he's gonna fall and I'm gonna be the one responsible for you know, hurting the, the lead singer. But he made it all the way around and it was a spectacular show. And so by the time they played the next time, we put in this stage, but the, the hard part was how do we take care of the organ? And so we this project was pretty expensive to begin with, but to fabricate the ability of the organ to come out of the stage added probably 20 grand to the equation and uh, but ultimately that's what we did and we preserved the organ to come up through the stage and then when we had uh, concerts and other events now there is this 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 vast area that they can deal with During the, the shutdown, we had no income coming in. I mean, it was brutal. And we decided that we would rent the marquee for messages. And at first we started putting up messages that were like, there's no place like home. I thought it was a really good, I didn't think of that, but what a good pun. Cause you know, they told everybody to stay home, oh. and, but then it has the movie reference and, and uh, all that. But then, then we started getting requests you know, for, hey, happy birthday, happy anniversary, and and we had marriage proposals too. And that, that does remind me that you know, actually, my sister got married here. Our, our booth tech got married here. And other a lot of people have requested to get married here. We don't do that many weddings. You have to kind of like twist our arm and, you know, really convince us that, that you know, you should have a wedding here because we don't want to screw up their, their magical day because <laughs> it's a lot of work. But, but yeah, people really have that sense of, 
of, ah, uh, that's what I remember as, you know, growing up. Shirley had basically ran that marquee. She did, we did have a couple requests for a funeral. And, and Shirley said, no, that we're not doing that. We, we'll do birthday parties and we'll do weddings and that kind of stuff, but we're not doing it. I've always think well, we had birthday parties for Willis. Yeah, we, we wouldn't this be a great resting place? I was th trying to think of, you know, I, I, I not to not to be morbid, but you know, when you think of your, you know, your 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 celebration of life, I'm like, what would be more appropriate than being here at the Tivoli? So I think if you know, oh my gosh. Yeah, so that would be the place to have. We'll it. have to rethink that policy. He won't be around at Bellevue. You can't. Well, I think so. he would like that. Well, he's yeah. you know so interesting. So I think I think that's what I've tried to tell him that that would be everybody would would really, you know, Definitely would embrace is. that, and I think you would too. So then you think back of you know all the good things. So that's that's important. And a lot of good things. The the most fun for me was was some of the kids variety shows oh, because yeah. they're so excited and happy and it's just great fun. Nothing like being on stage or on the marquee. Your name in lights or yourself in lights. There is nothing that can replace that. I guess hence the TikTok. Everybody wants to be a star. You know, this really, this really is the epitome of that, that feeling. I can tell you that my dad's dream and I'll let him explain, is to have a new marquee on the Tivoli that replicates the original marquee. With the only exception that it would have the LED so it would be able to change. But again, in the 50s, they put on this, uh, the, this marquee so it kind of faces the railroad track. It has more more size to it. Right now, we can't even get the letters, the, the, the company that made them, because everything is LED, went out of business and there are none to be had. But why don't you tell them about what you'd like to see up there? There, there was a crown, I, I call it a crown, on the top of the building, a terracotta crown, uh, which again, we have the, we have the plans for. But um, uh, for some reason, somebody at some point took the terracotta crown off. So if you look at the, if you go all the way to the top of the building, it's just flat with, uh, with the roof line where it used to. On top of the marquee, it's, it, and, and, and you look at the old pictures and it's like, well, that's still there. And then you look up there and it's like, that's not there. No. But it's, it's amazing what a, what a, um, sort of architectural statement it statement was it was yeah and it really uh, really is cool so over the years you know he's he's tried to it's obviously it's a it would be a passion project because you know there's there's not gr a great return on investment other than the satisfaction of looking at it and going yep i did it so that's that's the that's i think what you would like to have is yep. is that front restored to kind of bring back the 1928 vision. Ultimately, I see the vision is that we would add screens onto the theater and then we would add a entry into the bowling alley that was more just instead of stairs, but we would also add kind of a new hotel that would be a, a swanky throwback. It would have that vibe of um, kind of that, I don't want to say speakeasy vibe, but that, you know, you. 
you, you, I've been in like Austin where like the book take case turns and you sneak into the hotel and you have your room. But I, I see there being a, an opportunity to continue, you know, having the hotel, adding more screens, making the bowling alley to have more lanes and parties and that underground, and then having also more residents. So just really filling out the block, you know, this kind of downtown statement that starts with the Tivoli and we have these extended theaters so we can have a live concert in here without without forgoing uh, films because sometimes when we have a live event we'll have to not book like that great movie because the film studios won't allow you to have a break now we can you know move it over to a different auditorium I also would love to see you know a parking garage on the north side of uh, the tracks to to so we're not worrying about, hey, we got to, you know, find parking here and up and down the streets and whatever it may be. So I think those those would be my goal and uh, I'd love to be a part of it. I mean, I just think it would be just, it would be incredible, you know. We'll leave that to you. <laughs> those are good dreams. Yes. Yeah.